A very good afternoon to you and welcome on this brilliantly sunny afternoon to Present Politics. Well, this morning they appeared from the night, the weary, the footsore, the jubilant, the parish walkers. They had determinedly keep, kept going when all that was reasonable was saying, whoa, that's enough. It does seem a little like the battle the islands had since its ordeal by VAT slashed its available cash. Since then, it seems, after the heady days of, well, not exactly spend, 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 but approaching that, a considerably more measured approach has been required. And that continues in these last few weeks with the SAVE initiative, which we will be touching on this afternoon. Other items, looking at the newspapers today, which caught my eye, restaurants, cafes and takeaways in the UK may be obliged to put calorie counts next to food. Uh, which of Boris Becker's trophies to sell as the tennis star faces bankruptcy. EU officials have fined heavily in some cases fishermen in the VA port, the old port in Marseille, for not displaying the Latin name of fish on sale. Uh, and how they think the Aston Martin DB5, which disappeared after the film Goldfinger, may now have been traced to the Middle East. All exciting topics which you may or may not wish to cover, but uh, let me introduce my guests in the studio. And I'll start with uh, my guest on the right, who's the Treasury Minister, Alfred Cannon. Good uh, afternoon to you, afternoon, Mr. Cannon. John. Thanks for joining us. Not just to talk about SAVE, but many of the political issues that emerged during the month. Also, here is someone whose lightning campaign during the election won her a seat in Garford, has very much made her presence felt in question time in particular, but also in debate generally. Daphne Kane, MHK, hello. Hello. And to complete our three, our three Margaret Mansfield, no stranger to the microphone uh, and no stranger to a lot of areas, education, uh, MSPC, all sorts of areas you've been involved with, but here with Malou Commissioners. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, well, John. Let's just start with someone who appeared on the island, two people who appeared on the island, who could, I suppose, have a great deal of effect on our future. They are Dame Margaret Hodge and Andrew Mitchell, who came over last Monday for a lightning visit. Uh, Andrew Mitchell had never been here before, both MPs, of course, but members of the Westminster All-Party Group on Responsible Tax. Uh, you will have heard uh, Dame Margaret stand and very forcibly argue that the Crown dependencies, yes, that's us, should, uh, along with the overseas dependencies, uh, be forced to bring up public uh, beneficial ownership registers. Well, they came over to the island. They met a whole delegation of people, uh, regulatory heads, business leaders, government ministers, Howard Quayle, of course, who says the visitors left with, he feels, a better understanding of the Isle of Man. When you get over and you see the Isle of Man, it's so much better than just discussing an, a nameless place that you know nothing about. So I think that was really important that they came over and I was pleased that they accepted our invite. Did we change them? I very much doubt it. We obviously respectfully listened to what they had to say, but we have always said that when it becomes an international standard, then we will comply. And I think they will be working their hardest to make sure that it does become an international standard. So if we didn't change their views, what was the point of them coming over here? If we can, it was fairly obvious they weren't going to change their views, is it? Well, I do think it is important that we do have these uh, visits, particularly from people who pro possibly and probably don't understand what the Isle of Man has done over the years to bring itself fully up to speed in terms of its international standards. And whether or not uh, the whole visit changed Margaret Hodges or Andrew uh, Mitchell's minds uh, really is... is, is well, I think the indication at the end is, was it hadn't. Well, it's a, it, it's a byproduct. Effectively, it was an opportunity for us to uh, put our case forward. It was an opportunity for both sides to uh, have a discussion about this uh, matter. And I think part of the problem that you get when people like Margaret Hodge and Andrew Mitchell fly these flags so passionately for uh, open registers is that they haven't really understood what has gone on behind the scenes. And effectively, all the information that, that they are talking about is already being exchanged, I think, with some 63 countries under the common reporting standard. And the island has made huge inroads into making sure that there's a there's a significant amount of tax and money laundering and information that's been exchanged across the globe uh, with countries through our various treaties, through the common reporting standard, through the work that we're now doing um, with MoneyVal, the OECD. So it is important that they come, come across, I think, and I hope that they feel that uh, at least they've seen something on the island have learnt a little bit about what we're actually doing to meet international standards and I think we're probably going to beg to to disagree for the time being but I think the important thing is is that you know the island carries on 
uh, working towards meeting international standards and carries on engaging in the way that we're doing it. The the they will still argue that there is cash that should be going back to the tax authorities that is not going because of tax planning, that we'll call it. They'll say there's still that cash that is being missed out on. And that's where they're coming from, isn't it? Until they pick up the last fennig, the last penny, the last whatever, they will not be happy. Well, invariably, when you talk about these sorts of things, uh, you have to look at individual countries' own tax rules. Uh, the Island Man operates a uh, low tax uh, regime. It operates uh, efficiently, effectively, transparently. It's tax and, planning, and, isn't and it? And with integrity. Uh, and, you know, I'm satisfied uh, that we are making every effort to ensure that we are maintaining uh, and advancing our, our standards, particularly in financial services. And it is a fast paced global environment. And we've been through these arguments time and time again. We're moving forward. We're constantly taking, I think, the right steps um, to stay ahead of uh, the game, to stay ahead of many other countries, including the United Kingdom. Uh, and long may that continue. And in terms of the uh, open registers, uh, that's, that's something that's, that's an open discussion going on at the moment between a number of uh, uh, countries, between the OECD, between the UK and ourselves and uh, other Crown dependencies. Uh, and if the time's right, and if it's universally a, a going to be accepted as, as a standard, then we will follow. It's not but a I question think of if, though, it's Quayle's when, isn't it? position that, that we've got at the moment um, is the right one. Uh, and we, as I said, we will continue to maintain our position, maintain our position at, at, and I would suggest, at, at the forefront uh, of the other Crown dependencies and overseas territories on these uh, matters. Yeah, Daphne Kane, how do you view the island's position in this? I think it's very clear that the Isle of Man, as the Treasury Minister has said, it makes every effort to comply with international standards. So when we are recognised as being compliant with the IMF and the OECD for international standards, and the Isle of Man, as you said, will strive to continue to meet those international standards, the the um, the future of the Isle of Man depends on being recognised as a well-run jurisdiction. Yeah. Now, in terms of the um, beneficial owners being open in the UK, the, the Isle of Man would argue, I think, that the, our register, although it is only open to the tax authorities who are able to access it, the, the information that's provided is accurate, whereas, I, from my interpretation, the UK beneficial owners bill perhaps is not as accurately maintained or enforced in terms of standards as the Isle of Man Do you is. think a public register is inevitable? I think it will follow international standards and whatever becomes the the acceptable standard, the Isle of Man will But we won't go reach. there unless everyone else goes with us. I think in terms of business and the Isle of Man where we are, it could be very damaging to go further and first. So the Treasury Minister and I'm sure all the people in government will be keeping a very close eye on this. Margaret Mansfield, you're nodding your head there. You know, this isn't my area of expertise, but it sounds very much to me a case of keep your friends close and your critics even closer. And that's why I totally agree with the Treasury Minister that these people coming over is good for the island. They can see what we do. They're bound to see that there's something maybe they don't think we should be doing. But we can explain that. So, yes. We always say maybe, but I suppose in their view we are doing things we shouldn't be doing. And that uh, we should be, we're giving advantages when they feel we shouldn't be giving advantages, I suppose. It's well, the way the island has earned its living. It was encouraged to do by the UK It was encouraged to do. I think to go, that's the important point, When, when we it? suffered a loss of tourism, etc. Mm. Oh, well, just move on to the save um, initiative, which obviously has, has been brought in. Um, first of all, let's get it what it stands for. Um, it, it doesn't stand for just saving money, does it? I mean, that's not what it is No, designed the, for. The, the, the full title is Securing Added Value and Efficiencies. Isn't that saving money? And though? Well, of course it's saving money, but it's also we're looking at better ways to do things, getting more value for the taxpayer's pound. And that was really the, the ethos behind it, was to look at areas where there was uh, potential waste going on where there was area, areas that, that could be reformed, uh, areas that the public felt that the government um, was not properly managing uh, and you know by taking these uh, these ideas, the 1300 ideas don't forget John for, from the public, some of them some of them were consolidated into uh, various groups, some of those ideas were actually revenue raising, I, rev revenue raising ideas so we didn't look at those. But taking those ideas uh, and pushing forward, -ish, taking them out to um, departments where they were small ideas, taking the big ones, lumping them together and trying to see whether we had uh, grounds for to take forward consolidated uh, project, um, you know, means that actually what we're looking to do is, yes, 
uh, find uh, uh, savings in terms of direct cash savings. But ultimately what we're looking to do is to find uh, better ways to deliver the service, more efficient ways to deliver the service. Uh, and in doing so, you know, seek to get more transparency and accountability around how much money we're spending on these particular areas. I think you're estimating from this report that there's about six million pounds that could be saved uh, through these particular initiatives. But are you looking to reshape the island's structures of government within the aegis of SAVE? to reinvent it in, in some ways, because some of the ideas you have in here are pretty radical. Well, I don't know whether they, they're that radical. Um, I mean, let's... Uh, well, looking know. at the review of the Heritage Railway steam electric horse trams, um, looking at various other things, etc., they're reinventing some well, areas. There, there, are, there are a number of discussions going on within government at the moment about whether the government itself is best placed in terms of the way it's organised, the way it's set up, to effectively deliver the best value in, in the modern world that we're living in and, and much of those discussions goes around whether or whether we should or shouldn't have a, a single legal entity uh, and I'm sure we're going to be having more discussions about that that in the next 12 months there's a number of members of Timwood who feel that a single legal entity is a much more efficient and effective way to deliver uh, services rather than have uh, the, the multitude of departments that we have now and their legal structures their individual legal structures so we'll have those discussions but in terms of save yes I suppose the big one in terms of potentially offering a new way to deliver services was to recommend that the Department of Infrastructure made more effort to bring together the trams, the trains and, and the buses, deliver a consolidated plan for our trans effectively our transport system, uh, what we termed it transport for man, um, but to look and doing so to find uh, both cross fertilization in terms of Shared service, uh, well, efficiencies, shared service use that word efficiencies, and also you know opportunities to do things better. And when you look at w what we're spending in terms of buses and the railways and the, the nine million pounds or so that, that that's being uh, that it's costing the taxpayer on, on a on a yearly and annual basis, then I think these areas and and they were highlighted in the save. Uh, campaign. A lot of me members of the public were highlighting the fact they were um, unhappy with the amount of buses that were running around uh, three quarters empty, were uh, unhappy with the amount of money that was going towards subsidisation in this area. I think there's a chance, an opportunity to potentially do things better. The first step along, uh, along this route at the moment is to bring this within the department, put it all together. But we could have gone further, we could have taken that to an external agency uh, and looked at the opportunities that uh, externalising the service under one uh, uh, banner uh, would have would have brought, um, and particularly in terms of transparency and and accountability. And so that, that you know there is opportunity here to start shaping services in a different way, and we shouldn't be afraid uh, to look at these opportunities as they arise. So is the answer yes to my question? <laughs> I think I think it's not. No, I, I look. I, th I think there's lots of. I mean, without being too radical, it is an opportunity to look at things well, again. Let, 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 yes, there is an opportunity to look at things again. As I said, these conversations are going on within uh, government, and now is the time. Now is the time to have these conversations and actually to take things forward. We, the island, has been wrestling with these sorts of issues since 2006, when we first, when the island first produced. Uh, the scope of government report, uh, second scope of government report, almost a third scope of government report, if you like. This SAVE campaign is the first time, I think, that we've really got to grips and said, look, we're going to bring everything together and we're going to have a go at sorting some of these issues um, out. Can and and what, the one, the, sorry, just the one point, what we've got to stay focused on, John, in all this, is not just change for change's sake, but of course, this is all part of ensuring that in 2021, 2022, we transition our budgets through a very potentially rocky patch when the public sector pensions reserve runs out and we transition through and we do so smoothly so that the island itself uh, you know, has confidence and remains confident in the government and we don't cause a knee-jerk reaction at that stage. So, so that's the target. Let me just play a couple of clips. One from Tim Baker, Aaron Michael, your colleague up there. He says some of his colleagues misunderstand what this is about. Save is n was never about cutting services. You know, there were concerns about services being lost, but that wasn't the objective. The objective is about added value and efficiency, and we have to move down that path. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we don't lose things that make the Alaman 
special. Uh, a departing trade union head or departing in due course, Eric Holmes, uh, who's due to step down as Unite leader, says there's still plenty of work for his union to do. Uh, and he says he has deep concerns about the Manx government's what he terms profiteering. Sadly, uh, having seen the release of the SAVE report by the Treasury Minister Alf Cannon, I say there's a lot of profiteering going to be made there. As well as I say, there's likely to be a lot of profiteering being made with the steam packers. Although we don't have the party politics, as you know, we've got a Tory government and we've got 12 new incumbents who are still trying to find their feet. And unfortunately, they seem to be part of the fold rather than questioning the fold. So that concerns me. Let's just go to one of those members who's still finding their feet, Daphne Kane, apparently. Are you still finding your feet? Do you I feel think comfortable I, there? I yet? think I've found my feet in my particular corner of the Timbald Court. And also where Mr Baker was coming from and Mr Cannon, um, one person's efficiency saving is another person's cut. And I think we're playing semantics with the text. Yes, we all realise we must make these savings. There is going to be a public sector um, pension black hole. But why should services for the elderly, the young, the most vulnerable in society potentially be the ones that get cut to fund that black hole. I think that many, many times the services across government, the departments of government, the individuals working in those places know where the savings are to be made. They know where the waste is and that's where the focus should be. In terms of not understanding or getting the wrong idea that this means cuts, it's either going to mean cuts to wages or it's going to mean cuts to services. So are we saying that uh, there's one mention in the save report that the actual cost of a school child could be up to four pounds are we saying that instead of the 30p that it is currently per journey that we should be looking at charging school children or their parents more for each journey so you're talking about putting up costs you're talking um families having to pay more to put children on the bus or are you going to say that they aren't going well, to run school buses let's just go to mount mansfield here um obviously one way it would seem that you could get efficiencies across the island would be to join or Authorities together. Uh, Garth has done it, um, obviously, and they seem to be living at peace and equanimity with each other. Down I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> down in the south, we have a collection of uh, commissions, basically, who seem to find trouble, particularly Port Air and Ports of Mary. I'm not commenting on that. Uh, right. <laughs> but okay. no, what I will say is, Malou is. But you're a neighbour of these people. So we, the are, we, are actually, we are actually um, combining with Port Aaron now on, on certain areas. We have a steering committee. And we're starting off with refuse collection, and hopefully that will develop so in the future. So is this starting? It's starting, it's starting yes. It's starting. It's, it's starting very soon. Yeah. But some but people in talks object, with them some now. people say, we get our bins emptied more frequently if we're with this authority than we do Absolutely. with the authority. Is that a problem? Um, it's potentially, but not with Port Aaron and Maloo. How often do you empty the bin? Not you personally. No. I mean, how often are the Weekly? bins emptied? Weekly. Weekly. Weekly, yes. Yeah. Um, sorry, Mr. Cameron. But I, you know, I have to come back to Daphne there. This is not about cuts or raising the cost of uh, transport in this particular case or to try and do that uh, in, in, in some form across um, government. You know, I think the classic way to stop reform is to sort of raise alarm and start scaremongering right at the start before the process has, got, it, it, you know, has even started and got across the line. Uh, and what this is about is creating more accountability, getting more transparency into the situation, trying to pull these some of these services out of the murky depths of, of the departments, more, shed more light on them, and ultimately to get better value from them than the value that we're, that we're getting at the moment. And there are lots of people out there who feel that uh, you know there are better ways to, to run these services, better ways to integrate these services, more opportunity, um, and and we can deliver that. I'm sure that can be delivered. Uh, first, of, first and foremost, if we can see them being consolidated. Secondly, if we can get a proper three-year plan, as has been asked for from um, the department. And ultimately, I think we should talk about whether these services ultimately should go into an external agency so we can actually see what is going on and hold people accountable uh, for, for the delivery. And also, further, furthermore, you know, I don't think we'll ever stop subsidising some so of these you're services, the alarm bells but we can, we can find more efficiency and more accountability. Ms. Of course you can always find more efficiency. My gripe, I suppose, with the way this report is presented, the Treasury's own two uh, papers that they've had outside experts um, assess the bus company, the, the Treasury own save report says the bus company is, if, bus van in on the Isle of Man is efficiently run. So 
where I'm coming from is if it's efficiently run and you know that we're always going to have to subsidise certain amounts of rural routes which perhaps are not the most uh, the busiest, they don't have the number of people on, if that is for social inclusion reasons and the same way that the school buses are run, if those services were run as they would be in a local authority mm. across the water <coughs> the the local authority would be paying towards the, the bus routes that are run for social inclusion the local education authorities would be paying towards the the school buses. So if you took that into account and your own report says the the buses efficiently run, yet you're demanding a million pounds is saved, three hundred and thirty three thousand pounds in the first year. Where I'm coming from is to say the Department of Infrastructure sh perhaps should look for those savings but across its own hundred million pounds budget. Why particularly over the few millions of bus Perhaps uh, there are some savings within uh, there, but but the other one is the the education department is fully behind a consolidation of the higher education. But well, we'll this seems to be the driven for the by, by treasury. The sorry, just, in just, just in the report, it says some routes are being politically driven yeah, right. rather than. Would would you agree with that? Okay. Some routes are politically are there driven. For political reasons. Um, they have grown up, I think, because of political pressure. But are you saying that the the routes that go down to Port Soderick, the the routes that go to um, Groudal and Laxey two two per week, that they should be cut because they don't have a huge amount of usage? Mr. Okay. Cannon. Well, let, let, let's let's not get into speculation because that's exactly the the the, the, the thing that causes uh, unnecessary alarm when all this was suggest what this is suggesting is that we consolidate the services and we get a more transparent and accountable uh, plan about it but the reason why the reason why we don't just simply go to the department and effectively top slice which is what uh, Daphne has just just effectively said uh, ie remove a million pounds off the budget is because what's happened in the last five years uh, from my experience is departments have reacted negatively to to that they've sought to increase charges to the public in all sorts of different areas and what's happened is we've had a sort of drip 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 effect as I've called it of charges just raining down on onto the public and it's proved to be hugely unpopular and not very you're efficient. You're nodding your head And there. what, no, what okay. we're doing, and it's really important John, and you know, what we're doing here, what we're trying to do, and this is what the critical thing is, is to bring these projects together to give fair notice of, of what we're doing uh, and to try and shape things in, in a methodical and logical way. And behind all these projects, um, behind all these cost savings, there is, uh, a, there has been a, a credible uh, assessment of the opportunities that lie in front of us. Uh, I believe there's opportunities in this area, I believe there's opportunities in, in terms of the education, across the other areas that we've identified in that report, and we've still got a long way to go admittedly, but it's credible, it's got legs, and we should carry on working. Uh, just it. leave the last word with you, um, okay, unless yes, you want to yes, I, I, yeah. Margaret. Uh, I mean, I represent, as a Malu Commissioner, a very a rural community, mainly rural, and we're talking about efficiency, we're talking about all the buzzwords, but what about a service to the people who need to travel by bus? You Even know, at a cost? Well, put, yes. Put your rates up? Well, if necessary, 50, yes. 50p? If necessary. For a better bus service? I can't, I'm only speaking for myself here, not Malou Commissioners. <laughs> can, can, can I just put it to you, Daphne Kane? The, 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 Mr. Cannon does seem to be coming from the angle of efficiency, and you must admit there are areas of the island's operation efficiency would be welcome. There are many, and I also think that the suggestion that the budget process is reformed is a, is a very sound one, and that could lead to... Um, much better budgeting in terms of zero-based budgeting or to start from what what services should the government be responsible for delivering and at what cost. But I still feel that in terms of targeting the bus fan and, and admitting that it's somewhere that I used to work in customer service, so I know a little bit about the bus routes and the railways, but I, I the management is already consolidated. They already manage and supervise bus and rail. So so how is consolidation... So you're saying leave it, leave it as it is? No, I'm not saying leave it as as everything is worthy of review, everything, every area there can be made savings. But I'm just very cynical that you could make the level of savings that are being required by Treasury of this department and this section, this division of the department, without cutting salaries or reducing routes, reducing bus routes, reducing services or increasing the cost of travel. We're going to have to leave that. We have many other subjects to cover and we have to take one of these. The Nation Station. Thanks, Radio.
Now, you're listening to Present Politics, uh, and my guests in the studio is Alfred Cannon, the Treasury uh, Minister, Daphne Kane, the member for Gough, uh, one of the members for Gough, and uh, Margaret Mansfield of Malou Commissioners. This uh, come in, has come in from a listener. This government is spending money on non-essential items and saving is our essential de- and savings in our essential departments. I have recently been a patient in Nobles Hospital, and the wards nurses are so understaffed with long shifts. It's a disgrace that our ministers overlook this. Uh, these nursing staffs deserve better. Also, the Red Cross gave a marvellous service, especially to our elderly. But once again, government hit the elderly. A disgraceful, of course, we got the West Midlands Quality Review, which just finished its assessment. Very long res- assessments and very detailed. If you look at them, they go into virtually every department. Um, but does, Minister, do, do they have a case that, uh, that the health department is not getting what it should get? Well, we, we, you know, we know there's a lot of issues in the health department. Now, that's why we've got a, a significant review going on with Sir Jonathan Michael at the moment. Is he just not um, going to repeat what the West well, Midlands Well, no, the said. West Midlands was very much about the clinical performance of uh, the hospital. Uh, this is very much a much broader review into our whole delivery of health and social care services. And part of the objective of the review is to understand whether or not we're actually giving enough money uh, to, to this area. Uh, and if not, you know, what we need to do to, to plan more into the future. But hopefully this will be about integration. This will be uh, a real in-depth look at the service delivery on the island, what services should be delivered here, what services we should deliver uh, elsewhere, uh, and how health, uh, both the health care and social care can be better integrated, uh, both, both to operate more efficiently and effectively to get better outcomes and also to understand you know, what we need to do to ensure that as an island we are leading the way in healthcare, I and and part of that will be to look at look at other healthcare systems as well. So we're not we're not hung up here. Uh, so Jonathan Michael has a pretty open uh, terms of reference in, in in considering all these matters. He's got a good committee around him. He's talking to uh, health professionals, lay people. In fact, they're going out to consult with the public at this uh, uh, precise moment in time. And I would look out for the press releases and the information that will be uh, coming out of government for anybody who wants to contribute. So we we are taking positive action to both try and understand the problem and come out with solutions. And in doing so, when you look at where the NHS is across the UK, I would say we've actually uh, two or three steps ahead in undertaking this review at this precise well, time. Well, one thing the government does rely on, the health service, is bodies like hospice, who earn mm. an enormous amount of money. Now, uh, Margaret Mansfield, you've been involved, obviously, with the work of hospice. They do an enormous amount of money. The government rely on them in, in, in many areas, don't they? Not only on the Isle of Man, though. This is, I mean, this is uh, across the UK. Uh, but yes, they do Is there too much reliance put on these, these bodies? Um... I think I spoke well, I mean, they're quite some time ago. They're to, specialists in their area. Yeah, I spoke they? to someone who was actually a nurse at hospice, and I said, you know, how can you do this? Um, and she said, we are supplying what the National Health Service can't supply. So I think that sums uh, it up, really. Can't supply or won't supply? Can't supply, I think, because of resources. Hmm. Sorry. This is Kane. <laughs> well, in fact, I'm focusing on the area that's come into my mailbag mostly over the se- past several months is the area of children's health care. And in fact, last week's Tone World, I had a few questions on the subject. And th- there are actually a few supplementary points that I, and questions I was hoping to raise with the health minister that I didn't get to. But I would say in many areas, people in the the most need, the most vulnerable, perhaps are not getting access to those services. Children's health care particularly gets a very small percentage compared with the percentage of young people on the island. And for instance, in terms of social care, the, the Braddon Hub, for instance, was a centre that was enabling respite care mm. and overnight respite for parents of very seriously ill children with complex care needs, perhaps those who don't go into Rebecca House or, or have a, a life-threatening condition. But one particular case been going there for 10 years fantastic facility suddenly over the past year it has completely changed it's now full of clinical um, offices uh, podiatrists community care two stories of offices the rooms that were used for a severely autistic teenager a boy in nappies non-verbal and the family has a, a daughter as well as a son this boy went there for two days full respite in the holidays TT week when they went down there, the remaining area space where this child could could have respite it was too hot to use. The officers, the mother described as incredibly swanky, and this child she what couldn't do you mean leave too there. Too hot to be physically. Too physically hot. too hot to leave him there, and then the the sensory room that previously been put in this. Um, 
respite hub, the Braddon hub, the the, resp- the sensory room, which obviously calms down children with this condition, the, res- the, the sensory room had been removed and she was told that although the officers had all been fitted out, uh, the sensory room was going to require fundraising. Ken, Ken just obviously you've stepped back as being ch- children's champion. You are obviously passionate in this area. Wouldn't it have been better to stay in that post, despite how unhappy you were with aspects of it? Well, in fact, a lot of my mailbag has come from children who have mental health issues. There's over 800 people, the health minister told us, who are actually being treated by camp. Well, no, because the new remit, the new terms of reference for the new children's champion is very specific, that the chief minister, the government, wants the children's champion to focus mainly on looked after children. And the themes that have emerged to the the mailbag that I've had say very definitely that a lot of parents are in crisis with serious conditions on the waiting list for many, many months to be seen for mental health assessment, let alone treatment. Um, the people at the end of their tether, children who are not maybe accessing special needs at school, children who are out of mainstream education, they have parents, but they still want a children's champion Just to champion to the rights of their children. Mrs Mansfield is desperately trying to catch I am, my eye. Yes, um, because of wearing another hat, I'm involved with um, several schools throughout the island and I have to say, you're talking... The the other hat is education. Mm. Education. Um, You're talking about health care for these children, basically, aren't you? Because I must say, in the schools, the unit, the people who work in the units in the schools are absolutely superb and the facilities there are superb. So I take your point about the Braddon Hub particularly, but I I do think that there's probably a move afoot to try and... (laughs) basically join up the services if you join up health and and education i think that would be a very 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 good thing i think it comes back and i I really welcome the fact of the the comprehensive review that sir jonathan michael is undertaking because i think that is essential in terms of what shape should our health and social care Mm. services but particularly the health service look like for the future because at the minute um one of the the that you're saying about making savings and I think currently, perhaps for many years, that the health service in certain areas has been underfunded and that hopefully will come out of the review. Just move on to a subject that's uh, allied uh, to health and that's the use of cannabis, which obviously has been in the headlines recently in Canada. I think their recreational use, a small amount of cannabis is being allowed and obviously the argument um, goes on. Uh, This on the front page of the local paper. Um, One-tenth of all recorded crime is possession of cannabis. Home Affairs Minister's verdict on that, a waste of police time. Um, The Health Minister, David Ashford, uh, is being what what we term proactive about the issue rather than reactive. I think it's important that whatever we do is uh, is sensible, and certainly cannabis oil is one of the things that I've said in the past I want to look at to see if we can get it into the island for medicinal purposes. If there is a benefit for that, there is conflicting advice. Uh, let's be honest, some, some advice says that there is benefits to it, some says there isn't. That all will need to be properly weighed up and we come to a logical and sensible decision. Well, well that's cannabis oil. What about cannabis generally, uh, Treasury Minister? I mean, it seems to be the police, say, make a point of the fact it's, well, they regard it as using a lot of their money uh, to actually uh, get people who have possession of a small amount of cannabis. Should we say enough's enough, as they're doing in other countries, allow it? Well, I'm pleased, I'm pleased David Ashford is having a proper conversation about this because I think there is clear evidence now, or enough, certainly enough evidence, that uh, cannabis in some circumstances for medicinal purposes is actually helping people with their pain and some of the issues that that they are suffering with quite long-term and complicated health problems. So I I think it's a positive move that that this conversation is uh, going ahead. I think the broader issue of recreational recreational cannabis cannabis still needs Mm -hmm. uh, a much broader debate. Uh, I'm not passionate particularly uh, either way on this. I do think that we need to make sure that when you release this kind of recreational drug into into the community, you're absolutely positive uh, about the effects or clear about the effects that it is going to have. And I think as it stands at the moment, I wouldn't support uh, cannabis being released for recreational use until we were uh, further down the line and more advanced about how Uh, it would be properly managed and properly controlled. But I think what's important here is that uh, we do have a sensible conversation now about cannabis and and medicine and medicinal purposes. Uh, And I think it's probably 
uh, inevitable that, that we're going to see this brought in sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah, it would be odd, wouldn't it, if we in the Irish Sea um, didn't allow cannabis and all around us, all the other islands were starting to say, yes, we can have cannabis. And we, it would be a reverse position of what we perhaps were in decades past when we allowed things that the others didn't. But it would be it would be tricky to get out of step with the surrounding areas. I, I completely agree mm. in terms of recreational use of cannabis. Now, I've had um, experience never having taken any drugs, not even smoked a cigarette, um, but at two friends, one school friend, one on the island, both had brothers who who got hold of cannabis at a very young age and both of whom suffered lifelong effects from of psychological effects. They didn't move on to other drugs. It wasn't a gateway no, drug, it was just cannabis. No, but it so. had a really bad effect on their mental health for the rest of their lives. One's no longer with us and it and took his own life in his thirties. So I think we have to be really careful about accessing um, drugs, any drugs for recreational use. I, I really welcome the health minister's move on this in fact i find on in, in all the matters that i've raised including the one about the bread and hub i've always found the health minister very willing to engage and to listen to the issues and to take action and come back with the answers and policies from the department so i think he's doing absolutely the right thing to say they are looking at it they're ahead of the game in a way they're not having to be reactive to any particular case but a, a pragmatic review of what the isle of man should allow for medicinal use i think that's right and proper in with the health department and i look forward to the outcome of their deliberations but in terms of um, without going as far as legalizing cannabis or any drug for recreational youth I, I do think it's important that we we take note of the chief constable's figures and that we stop criminalizing a lot of young people but criminalizing anybody for for possession of small amounts and and that that hopefully is something that we will have a conversation about shortly mrs mansell uh, i think there are so many drugs around now that are legal if you like alcohol cigarettes um, and you can see the damage that's done by people drinking too much some of my friends might laugh at that but still um, I think it would be potentially very dangerous to legalize cannabis very very dangerous indeed but I do agree cannabis oil is, is a different matter uh, decriminalizing decriminalizing yes in terms of but, low level yes but you're amounts. opening the door aren't you by, by doing that you're saying it's well, a gateway but yes i think the door's yes. wide open i think there are many many just given the mm. chief constable's figures mm. if the a 10 percent increase in crime is because of low level possession i think i think that the isle of man has to address that and decide what yeah. it wants to do it, it seems to me that kind of I'm, I'm again this is not my area but a can, cannabis is something where people sit down and they smoke it okay arguably Whereas, less um, dangerous than i was alcohol. going to say with alcohol people go out and vandal or can go out and vandalize as we've seen recently with a couple of the schools mm. which have been vandalized but i i can't quite see that you'll i mean you start off with baby sham and then move on to gin <laughs> with cannabis if you start off with cannabis it's just one evening on. or <laughs> no not not necessarily <laughs> one evening i've never had baby sham but then you move on to another drug i don't know if you would stop with that it, it's mm. i think it's a very very dangerous precedent let's hear what people have to say uh, from outside we're, we're going to take a short break but let me just read out a couple of contributions i don't think anyone will be able to answer this one um, when isle of man transport take over patient transfer services will this be serviced by a standard bus driver or will they be they, will there be a small qualified team? I don't think anyone can really answer that one here. And this comes from Kevin Weir, uh, Castletown Commissioner, of course. Um, as the new owner of Steam Packet Company, could you, and this uh, presumably did Mr. Cannon, could you explain the cost of getting on and off the island? I'm just trying to book a return ticket on the 4th of August. It's going to cost £506 for a car. Also, foot passengers for the same date, 216 return for, for two. Now, I know it's the season, but the buses don't put up the cost of travel. It's the same all year. And uh, oil goes down in the summer. Should the government be looking at concessions for local residents? That's uh, a bugbear that's been around for some time, Mr. Cannon, isn't it? Well, I hear, I hear that argument. Obviously, it's a very early stage for me to start... Yeah. commenting on whether or travel. not there will be any impact as a result of this on on directly on the on the cost of travel because there's quite a lot of work to be done but the one thing i i, I would say that you know when we looked at this whole deal uh, and we went back over the paperwork the comparisons the fair comparisons per mile on the on the sea compared with other uh, ferries across the British Isles actually compare reasonably well and and relatively favorably and i think you know i p People are, you know, quite subjective about this, and uh, I can see that I can see there is a high cost to uh, transport. Uh, there is in in a lot of areas, and obviously a lot of this has been made a lot more uh, 
challenging because of the, the, the co low cost airlines effectively and you know we can all get some pretty good deals if you book early enough on on oh, on we've the, heard people on the air but, but the, the important thing well. is i think what the important thing is i'd say to kevin and everybody else you know give us a chance we 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 uh, have uh, committed to effectively tr trying to ensure that the steam packet runs as a commercial organization it has to make a profit because it's got a number of commitments in terms of new ships uh, breakdowns a number of issues that throughout the year that it, it will deal with you know we need to talk and, and discuss with the steam packet how this is going to operate most effectively in the greater economic interest um, of the island uh, and in doing that we obviously want to make sure that the, the steam packet is operating in the best interest of the shareholders so these are all issues that we will be discussing with the Steam Packet as we negotiate what type of framework they're operating under and uh, those frameworks which are going to be through the user agreement and the shareholder uh, management agreement uh, will be absolutely critical and they will be public because we will be bringing them back and have committed to bringing them back to Tim Ward so that Tim Ward can vote on them as well, people's Before we go to the break, let's just get the view of uh, Mrs Kane on that. You were trying to get in there. Well, I think it's absolutely normal practice that it's a supply and demand situation. So as you come up to a busy time, Time, school holidays the the when when the boats start being full the price goes up I booked myself for two weeks time the first couple of weeks of the school holiday car plus four children travel free um, the basic price was 250 pounds I put a few extras on including a cabin but I still think for 350 pound travel school holidays only booking less than a month ahead is pretty good but I think it absolutely demonstrates how important it is that the steam packet is removed from the politicians that it stays as an arm's length company and the only involvement of the politicians is to get the user agreement right. So the user agreement should set set out the stall for exactly what the steam packet needs to provide back to government and then let the professionals get on with running the company. Both Mr Cannon and uh, Mrs Mansfield, yeah, I, I think, just a quick contribution. Yes, very quickly. I think the, the important thing is to provide the service and people are always going to complain about the cost of anything. But if the service is good, that will make a major difference. Let's take a break. Asian, you're listening to Present Politics. Just five minutes to go. My guests in the studio, Margaret Mansfield of Malou, Commissioners Daphne Kane, MHK for Garth and Alfred Cannon, uh, the uh, Treasury Minister, also MHK up in the north there for air, and Michael. Um, th this from Mary. I wanted to hear what Mr Cannon had to say about the Braddon Hub. Um, he, he actually is not familiar in that area. We were t I was talking to Daphne Kane about it, but um, Mary goes on, you hurriedly went on to cannabis use. Sorry, we have so many subjects I'm trying to cover. Um, this is a desperate situation. The parents of these children and find themselves in uh, respite and daycare vitally important for parents and children alike lady involved is education in education astounding ignorance of children too disabled to attend school special units I, I hear a jaw dropping what? over there <laughs> uh, these children don't need health care they're not sick just need appropriate center for their capabilities including learning and behavior issues unbelievable Yep. Well, I think the point I was making about the Braddon Hub is that it was um, purpose-built as a respite centre for children with serious medical, complex medical health needs and a respite centre essentially for their parents, but it is now not filling the purpose it was purpose-built for. Did you just move on to an... Sorry, Mr Cannon, did you want to say something on that? Well, I, I think, you know... I don't know sp specifically, uh, you know, the Braddon Hub. I'm, I'm willing to look at that in a bit, a bit, bit more detail with David Ashford. I mean, the key point is, uh, you know, we were talking about that subject before. I mean, we're all uh, effectively children's champions as as MHKs, and we all have, uh, I would expect, a number of difficult and complex uh, constituency uh, families, families in our constituencies who have children with serious physical and mental. Uh, health issues um, and you know I'm, this is a complex uh, area almost every single case I can think of within my constituency the particular children have different needs and uh, requirements uh, parents often go through very traumatic periods in their uh, lives looking after uh, these children to take a huge amount of responsibility and care in doing so uh, and frankly you know I have seen cases where access, getting access particularly to some sort of respite uh, care is incredibly difficult um, but so it's it is an area also, that needs looking well, it, at I think you know we're all I think it would be an irresponsible government that's not always looking at this area because I think needs uh, developments of science developments of theories and, and practice are always um, moving on but absolutely we do need to make sure that that these children have proper environments uh, to go to so that the parents can uh, be relieved of some of the uh, burden that they face in uh, caring and raising 
uh, children, particularly, particularly children, uh, and we need to be responsible and we need to make sure that there are uh, proper facilities around. So if we're, if we're falling down... There was a proper facility. If, if, Sorry if, to break it, there was if, a proper facility. On, and now overnight respite, for instance, has moved to Ramsey. Well, so the, 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 hmm. the so respite centre there was need, has been these reduced These issues, from these issues the need to be resolved and they need to be looked at properly uh, and we need to make sure we're doing so. So, you know, this is a subject clearly you, you've, you're, you're passionate about. I'm not particularly uh, aware of the Braddon hub per se and its decline in its performance, but we need to look at that if that is the case. Change of Let use. me just read this out from a listener. Well said, Daphne. My son is now 36. Cannot believe our caring island still has no proper care for severely disabled children. Where is joined up government? They are aware of these children, their needs from birth, but still no planning for their future. Margaret Mansu, nodding your head vigorously. Yes, I am, because I think the, 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 the person who was complaining before about um, the children, for instance, in the units who... Uh, are not ill. They're not ill, but they have certain needs. And Daphne is highlighting the, the special needs of the children at the Braddon Hub. And I think this all does have to be joined up so that um, it, it's not seen as a, as a disability. It's seen as another area where we can help. Yeah, you've, you, you, despite the fact you no longer hold the role, you still have children's champion written all over you. <laughs> Absolutely, she does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Mr Cannon said, we are all yeah. champions for children and, and for all our constituents and the various issues they bring to us. I think the point about the change in terms of reference for the Chief Minister's Children Champion is that that is principally for looked after children. All MHKs are also a responsibility as corporate parents. But the themes that have come to me are quite often people, uh, children who, who do have parents. Well, we've come all too quickly to the end of our first hour. Thank you indeed to my guests, who I'm glad to say are all staying on for the second half of The Man in Line. That's Alfred Cannon, the Treasury Minister, Daphne Kane, MHK for Gough, and Margaret Mansfield of Maloo Commissioners. And the time now is one o'clock, and that's news time.